All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And this is part seven of the 700 line Pranyaparamita Sutra, otherwise known as Manjushri's Discourse on the Pranyaparamita. This is part seven. So no need to introduce the sutra. Uh, you know what's going on. It's the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, discoursing endlessly, relentlessly on this idea of profound wisdom. Uh, just to remind everybody, of course, I kind of am reading from a treasury of Mahayana sutras the translation as it's found in the Chang translation, but we're also referring to the Edward Konza Perfect Wisdom, the shorter Pranyaparamita discourses, but I'm also been working on and I'm almost done with my own translation of this sutra. Uh, and I actually have kind of a little bit to say about the relationship between those three, which is the existing English translation from the Chinese, the existing English translation from the Sanskrit, and then what I'm working on. Um, so yeah, so I will say about that. And for tonight, well, let me just let me just start tonight for, off with the theme tonight. The theme tonight is achintya or achintyata, achintyata. This idea of inconceivable, the inconceivable. That's what we're talking about tonight. Or in fact, what we're going to be talking about is how can one talk about that which is indescribable, that which is ineffable, that which is truly inconceivable, unthinkable, unsayable. What do you do? What do you do with that? That's the theme for tonight. This sort of, well, it's a very, very interesting idea. And indeed, the whole suture has been building up to this idea of the inconceivable. And so that's the theme for tonight. Um, like I said, I have a lot to say about the various translations that are around, including the one I've been working on. Um, I'm kind of excited about working on the, ver the translation I'm doing because I gotta tell you, while Edward Konza's uh, translation from the Sanskrit, it's complete. Unlike, <laughs> unlike this version where they just decide very haphazardly and randomly just to start dropping stuff, you know, and we've talked about this, that it's kind of really unfair to you, the reader, that there's just all these omissions. There's no omissions in the Konza translation, but I will, I will tell you, if you go and look at his notes, on the, ver the Pranyaparamita Sutra in 700 lines, uh, Edward Konza relates to us that this version is definitely older than 500 AD. Good to know, right? He says that my translation of only the first part, there's two parts of the sutra of which we've only been in part one up to now. He says, my translation of only the first part is reliable. <laughs> what does that say about the second part? <laughs> well, I can tell you, it's not, it's not so much about the reliability of it, it's about the intelligibility of it. Meaning that if you read Edward Capone's translation from the Sanskrit, he's, he's a scholar par excellence, and so he is true true to the Sanskrit word, often leaving you bewildered in English with these like amazing sentences of ideas, but you're kind of left wondering like, what? And you know, this, this sutra, this, this sutra is already like, what? 
it's already like that. Like if you get what they're talking about, but then to add a little, a little dollop, a little sprinkling, a little layer of in un unintelligibility, just utter word salad on top of that. <laughs> oh, I feel terrible. And so I'm excited to bring to the world a fresh, clean translation of the whole sutra, but from the Chinese, which again, we know this is only partial. Um, so with all of that going on, with this information available, texts available, new translations happening, it's getting a little tricky. <laughs> this started to happen last week. It's, it's getting a little tricky as far as like reading this thing, like reading it line by line or even section by section. Um, you know, and I know last week, it, you know, it's, it's, it starts to get a little tedious and it starts to get tedious because these ideas are tr tricky. And so we're kind of like saying a few words, pausing, talking, thinking, contemplating, grasping, and then doing a few more words and you don't get, you don't get the real flow and the feel for this sutra. And I apologize for that. This is sort of, uh, of all the Dharma doors, this is probably the most like live translating that's been happening. Um, meaning that you're kind of seeing it happen. You're seeing a lot of the thinking take place, the, the difficulty of the text. And so the problem with that, of course, is that um, if you were to eventually step back and, and for my SoundCloud page, I will probably do a clean reading of this whole sutra just from beginning to end so that you can hear more of the rhythm and the way the ideal, ideas kind of build up and build up and build up. And so again, I apologize for this sort of start and stop but it's a tricky text and you, it's, it's difficult because you kind of either need to just read it and it's kind of doesn't make any sense, but it's going to sound interesting. And so I could just sort of like shower you with, with the Dharma that way, or I could do it the way I've been doing it, which is actually trying to unpack what this sutra is talking about. And so tonight I'm going to continue with that. And so we're really only gonna be talking about three ideas tonight. They're interrelated and they're arguably the same idea. They are the idea of the achintya or again, achintyata, if, if you wanna call it the, the inconceivable, like as a noun, like the inconceivable, that's achintyata or achintyata. If you're just talking about inconceivable, like a ver uh, an adjective, it's achintya, inconceivability, or the in or just inconceivable. That's the main theme tonight. But in the same breath, we're going to be talking about a very, very heavy duty idea tonight. Uh, Buddha tathata, what I was calling last week, ultimate reality, or just like capital R reality hold off on that just hold off on that for a second and then we're gonna also be talking about this i don't know if you can see the bottom of it but this is apada apada means without tracks and by tracks we mean like a like a footprints like an you know little animal footprints that you could follow the tracks so you could kind of follow the trail of an animal or something, you would follow the tracks. This is about the trackless, not a pada. And you might be familiar with the Dharma pada, the Dhamma pada. Those tracks of traces, famous collection of the sayings of the Buddha, the Dharma pada. This is a very profound idea, which is the a pada, no pada, no tracks. Okay, so these are the three ideas we're going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to be referring to sections of the, of the sutra. I'm going to do my best to refer you to where I'm reading from the, the two various translations. 
it gets very tricky to do that though. Um, but yeah, that's it. Real simple stuff though, really. We're really just going to try to talk about to end describe the indescribable. I mean, light, light work, I think the kids say. It's a little, little light work on a Sunday evening. So, okay. Um, by the way, I mentioned about where, where we're at in the sutra. This sutra is divided into two parts. Um, my scholarly assumption about these parts is that they are not, um, how could you say, they're not uh, uh, part of the text. They are probably, uh, this is actually very interesting, but I shouldn't even go off on this at all. But the two parts are probably indicative of the material uh, in which they were preserved, meaning if they were a scroll, then you could probably only fit so much on one scroll. And so you had two scrolls or whatever it might be, a folio or something. But my guess is, is that the division of this into two parts was strictly about space. And the reason why I say that is, is because both of these versions, the Sanskrit, sorry, the Sanskrit and the Chinese are both divided into two parts, but they're not divided in the same section. And that sort of indicates to me that this is more about the original way in which these were preserved and not so much about a, logical, uh, a logic of the text. That being said, we're just about to conclude part one. So if you're in the Chinese translation that I know a lot of people have, we're basically at the end of page 104, but that's where they just start throwing you, throwing dots at you left and right. They'll throw some ellipses at you mid-sentence and then pick it back up as if you just, it's really wild. The, the wanton use of ellipses in this text. So we're basically at the end of part two. Uh, and I think in, in the Sanskrit text, we may have already ventured into part two. But again, that's, that's kind of tricky to say, but it doesn't really matter because we're here to talk about a few very interesting ideas. And I'm gonna regale you with quotes from the sutra with my grand attempt to explain this thing. <laughs> any, any questions so far? <laughs> sweet. I'm gonna change my- Hey, Michael. Yeah, yeah, oh, sweet. Now we're back. Now I can see everybody. Hi. Hey, Eric. Hey. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask a question, uh, more like historical and uh, comment question or from your comment uh because uh well you you just talk uh, uh about uh translation and the way you're working with this sutra and as i'm learning sanskrit i'm starting to notice when i'm reading about the sutras i'm studying that the sanskrit uh, versions are uh, almost every time lost for some reason we, uh the uh, the translations for many Mahayana sutras uh, come from the Chinese or Tibetan, such as uh, Vimalakirti, even when I already saw a Sanskrit version, but I don't know if that's a refound version or a reconstructed, but whatever. What I really am pointing at is the lack of Sanskrit uh, evidence or archives per se, right? Uh, in that way. So, uh, and also because you have taught uh, and uh, given uh, lectures on Buddhist history, I I've noticed that in those uh, lectures, you haven't really mentioned or talked too much about the Arabian invasions uh, to India that eventually uh, experienced Buddhism in India and the destruction of great universities such as Nalanda and with it, the archive of the uh, Sanskrit uh, sources. So yeah, yeah. what's <laughs> up with that? <laughs> what's, up, what's up with that? Well, I mean, you said it, Eric, um, the subcontinent of India, like the rest of 
earth as a complicated history. And I have avoided sort of talking about that <clears throat> kind of larger history of kind of like why Buddhism died out <laughs> in India. Even, even that kind of nomenclature of died out is, is sort of, you know, that's kind of not really a good way to speak of it in that way. Um, yeah, Eric, I don't, you know, because I have a lot of fun ideas I want to talk about tonight, I'm not going to uh, say too much about that, except for that the Sanskrit sutras that were produced in India, mainly Northern India, yeah, because of the historical events, the um, Islamic incursions into uh, India, that's mainly what Eric's referring to as far as the Arabian kind of uh, encounter with India. Um, you know, and that's a complicated history unto itself. Um, all of these cultural transitions, Christianity sweeping across Europe, Islam sweeping across, um, you know, a lot of the world, these, these historical moments are complex because they do lead to things like Eric's talking about, which is that we lack a lot of original Sanskrit versions of these texts because there was a cultural change for a variety of reasons in India where they kind of moved either to a new religion or back to an old, older religion or a lot of things. And so I can only say, Eric, that it's the importance of, if you're interested in studying Buddhism, it's the importance of learning Tibetan because all the sutras, all the texts, all the commentary, all the texts that are in Tibetan originally came from Sanskrit. And so even though the Sanskrit versions of a lot of the texts don't survive. They survive in Tibetan versions and those are very close to uh, Sanskrit ones. So that's what I wanna say about that. And I, again, I can't really go into the larger history. I, I Some other night, maybe a visual presentation I will, but not tonight, Eric. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the comment, I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to start tonight, uh, again, I don't, I'm not going to like re actually read line by line from the sutra and explain it. I actually have a few parts of the sutra I want to read to articulate these ideas that I have on the board and to generate a nice discussion about, about these ideas. I kind of wanted tonight to be a little more uh, discussion in that way. Um, well, Again, what we're talking about tonight, the theme of tonight is the inconceivable. And whether we're talking about this really wild idea of reality, right? But, but, Buddha, not Buddha, but Buddha, very similar uh, pronunciation and word, but this Buddha Tathata, Tathata meaning suchness, Buddha meaning like uh, real substantial, so real substantial suchness would be a way to translate this idea. But whether we're talking about the inconceivable, the this, this wild idea of reality, or if we're talking about the apada, trackless, this is sort of synonymous with signless, characteristicless, right? No lakshana, that's what apada is. If we're talking about these ideas tonight, we are squarely in the Mahayana. <laughs> the ideas that we're talking about tonight put us squarely in this tradition called <clears throat> Mahayana, Mahayana. And what we're talking about tonight are kind of really what separate this Mahayana Buddhist tradition from an earlier Buddhist tradition that does not talk so much about the inconceivable reality or even this language of signlessness and tracklessness. 
So we're going to be deep in Mahayana realm tonight. But we're also going to be just deep in philosophy land world. <laughs> and and what I mean by that is that the very I the very idea concept, I, I don't even know what to call it, <laughs> but the very idea that we're wrestling with tonight is as old as philosophy gets. It's as old as Plato and Aristotle. It's as obviously older. This is Buddhism. It goes way back before those guys. But what I'm getting at is that the ideas tonight are like first philosophy ideas. This is like fundamental ideas. And so, I mean, that's, so that's fun. But what I'm going to try to do is kind of wrap these deep philosophical ideas that are at play in Western philosophy, Eastern philosophy, you name it. But I'm going to try to then explain how they are dealt with in a Buddhist context, which makes them uh, practical. <laughs> let's, let's just, I guess, just put it that way, practical, like there's a practic practical application to this stuff, All right? So let's begin. <laughs> this idea of achintya, the inconceivable, this is in the sutra, just to give you a, a preview, the sutra is going to put the Buddha, Pranya, Pranya Paramita, Buddha Tathata, all of these ideas in, in a certain paragraph will be equated. That Buddha is the inconceivable, the inconceivable is reality, reality is this, that they're all ultimately strung together, that it's all pointing to the same thing, that classic Zen saying of the finger pointing at the moon. So tonight we're going to talk about the moon with these. We're going to talk about the moon with some fingers is what I'm getting at, is that we're going to be doing the thing where we're going to be talking about something with what language and words, but it is not a word. It's not language. It's not a finger but it's in indicative, it's indicating these things. And so this is what I mean by what we're doing tonight is first philosophy, basic, basic philosophy, which is this. How could one conceive of such a thing as the inconceivable? Better yet, better yet, it's this idea of, well, what we're going to be talking about tonight is language, this mysterious thing called language, words and speech. It's what we're going to be talking about tonight, all right? And, you know, words and speech, you know, the, 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 the idea of this is, is that, well, first of all, let's, let's start the philosophically, we need to start here. Language, these words that we use to, to uh, express ourselves and also to understand things. Tonight, it will be helpful to keep in mind or to think about how language sort of operates from two directions. And what I mean by that is, is that on the one hand, our very thinking is done in language. That it's like, you know, the inner voice that thinks about things and thinks that it would want something. Well, that is done through language in a way. Because 
part of the idea tonight, and I'm, I'm going to try to prime us now, like get us our little, our little prana going. But the idea is, is that anything that you could possibly think of would, would then be art, articulatable as an idea, as a word, as a concept, as an idea. And that which you don't have a word for, arguably, and I say that honestly, arguably, you can't think of it. And as soon as you have a word for it, now you can think of it. Now, I want to give you an example to, to clarify something right from the get-go. And what I mean by that is, is like, you know, that you, you might find out like, you know, oh, the Japanese, it's always the Japanese, right? The Japanese have this really great word. You know, they have a really great word for like, you know, a memory you've never had before or something. And you might be like, oh yeah, that's, that's, I've, I know that. I, oh, they have a word for that? I know that. And right then, you might say, oh yeah, I know that feeling. Oh, they have a word for that feeling? Cool, now I know the word for that feeling, but you already had a word for it, which is a feeling. It was already a class, it wasn't a cat, it wasn't a dog, it wasn't uh, pink, it was uh, a feeling of a memory you haven't had already. And then you learned a new word, which is a Japanese word for that. But what I mean to say is, is that the language that we're talking about is not exclusively letters and words. What we're talking about in terms of language is that language is all relative. This is what Wittgenstein called the language game. That the language game, that all the words in your language game are relative to the other words. And so you have this whole arsenal of things like feelings versus sights versus sounds versus days of the week versus like you already have this whole arsenal of compartments of ideas of which you use to think. And most of the time, or I, I shouldn't speak for you, for me, most of the time, this is an internal dialogue that's in English. And I kind of dabble in a few other languages. And so every now and then I find myself sort of thinking in a different language, but the thinking is always in language. And if, again, if you refer to my earlier remarks about even if you learn a new word for like a feeling you had, you already knew it was a feeling. You already knew that it was in a class of that. So just because you got a new word for it, you already had an old word for it. It just maybe wasn't as glamorous as a Japanese word or something like that. But my initial point here is that language is weird and wild because thinking itself sort of takes place in language. And then, and then this is the really, really, really interesting part about this. You might say, no, 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 no. I, I think all the time outside of language. I have all these ideas that have no words and whatever, right? Great, tell me about it. My point is, is that any like little solo universe where you're in, it's, it's like, I don't know, that's great. That's great. And honestly, and I mean this not sarcastically because the inconceivable is the Buddha is enlightenment. So if you're dwelling in the inconceivable beyond words, having experience beyond language, I Awesome. We're, talking about that. We're talking about that. So I don't want to dissuade anybody from thinking you're not having Buddha knowledge experiences. But I do want to sort of push you a little bit to think about how you think. It's what we're doing tonight. And so I just want you to think about 
the role that language plays in your thinking process and the degree to which your thinking is informed by language. And you may, if you're kind of a, I don't know, anthropologist or something, reflect, <clears throat> or even a neurologist or something, reflect, think about the infant and the infant consciousness, infant experience. And by that, I mean, of course, mean the behavior. Because I, I, I can't remember exactly what it was like to be an infant, but I've been in the presence of an infant. I see what they're up to, sitting there utterly confused and <laughs> amazed <laughs> at it all, right? So any anthropologist or neurologist, linguist or otherwise, would, might start thinking, oh yeah, as a baby acquires language, they start to develop the thinking thing that then allows them to articulate themselves to other. And other than just, ah, they can be like, I want blank, blank, blank. I want this. They, and, they, and then because they now have the words for, I want this, they can think about, you know what I want? And so there's this way, again, this isn't even Buddhism. We haven't gotten to the Buddhism yet. We're just talking about good old cognitive philosophy tonight. <laughs> and good old cognitive philosophy is talking about the role of language in thinking. And the position, you know, the position here tonight, the Buddhist one, will be that all deluded, confused, ignorant, all delusion, confusion, and ignorance is predicated on language in a way. And the inconceivable liberation, cessation, nirvana, buddha, I could be here all night with all of these words, that is kind of beyond language. Indeed, it's the inconceivable. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. So now that we've kind of addressed the issue that consciousness itself and thinking that this happens in language, the, the mind, the, the thinking. Now let's shift gears. <laughs> and now let's take a look at what we think we're thinking about. So no longer the mind thinking, but now it's the, the world of objects and things, right? And this is sort of where I'm gonna attempt to segue us back to the sutra. And it has to do with this world out here. So not in here, the one I'm thinking about, but this one out here, you know, oh look, a laptop, oh look, you know, telephone, cup, look at my cup. So this world of stuff, you might have already noticed <laughs> it's, it's happening in language. Oh my gosh, these words and these ideas that I use to communicate to you, but also, and this is where we get into the Buddhism, of course, which is the language, the language over here in reality, not, so not the mind, but over here in the world. But the way in which language is this interesting convention, as we would call it, a convenience, right? And so the, the classic, my classic Buddhist example of the, the language game out here is this one. This is one of my favorite examples of the language game which is, if, 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 you're, if you're looking at your screen, you might see that I'm holding up a fist. And a fist is a word, <laughs> it's a piece of language, right? The fun of the word, does it cease being a fist? And then you realize, oh, the fist is gone. Where did the where did where did the fist go? Is it over here? <laughs> is it down there? 
like where did it go and if you know that it didn't go anywhere oh and you realize oh it's back it's back the fist is back but like tathata like suchness like the buddha itself the fist has no coming and no going it's here behold behold right the fist right but the idea is is that if you think that the fist is a noun in space then when i do that and i ask you okay then where did the noun where did the noun in space go <laughs> and it, right then you should be like oh there was no noun in space there was my mind recognizing a formation a form and i have been con conditioned with a word for that formation and the formation is is oh look there's the formation again behold the fist no formation no fist what i want to get out get to out here is the way that the role that language plays in this world we live in don't shake your fist at me sorry right so if there was a situation like that where it was bothering somebody that i was shaking my fist at them and they said please don't shake your fist at me and i was like oh sorry I was like, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get rid of the fist. All of that would take place in language. But is there a fist? Is there not a fist? There's a word. <laughs> and if you get what I'm kind of dancing around right now about how there is, like, there, there's the, like, <laughs> there's, like, there's the like the person who has the word thinking that there's a fist there <laughs> there's that right ta 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 this idea the idea of there being these things these words and this language but recognizing that it's just labels with no substantive reality other than other than this, other than the mind thing. So if you get that, everybody feeling okay with that? If you get that, then what we're talking about is how language is now at play both in that which I think I'm perceiving and the, the, the perceiving or conceiving or thinking of that thing. So... I don't want to alarm anybody, but this might just be some weird matrix of language then. <laughs> that, that's, that might be what's going on here then. Oh my. So, I can have a quick question. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, you drop a lot of wisdom bombs right now, like so many. I feel it's hard to catch up. Oh. Um, but my question is, so if I understand what you um, just shared with us, um, could I say that a house is first language and then a house? So first the house and then the ha In a sense of if I wouldn't have a, have a name for this building, you know, this form, then it would be nothing, labelless or whatever, nothing. So, if, but once I have house, the house appears. You know what I'm like? Yes. And what you're, what you're saying, Connie, makes me want to make it even crazier. Which is one of these words, house, fist, right? Let's, how, or sorry, fist, could you, can, could you conceive of 
Could you imagine and think of a fist without fingers? It's almost like I'm boarding on a koan here. And, and by the way, this, the koan stuff is, is about the inconceivable. It's very much about trying to touch that which is indescribable, ineffable. All the koan work is, is about that, by the way. And so tonight might get really kind of koan that way. But when I say, can you conceive of or think of a fist without fingers? You, 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 even, I even tried right now. Your mind might be like, yeah, well, I don't even, I mean, that's, that's like what a fist is, is folded in fingers, which are part of the hand. Oof. And the idea is, is that if I were to take the roof off of your house, would it still be a house? Aren't houses supposed to supply shelter? And so if there's no roof, then there's no house. But if I put a bunch of straw or thatch or tile on the ground, let's say, so that nobody can get under it for shelter, is that a roof? Oh, so a roof is only a roof when it's on top of a house, but a house is only a house when it has a roof. <laughs> But isn't that like, is this not a question of what we all agree on? Because, you know, in regards of house, obviously at some point we learned, not we learned, but we had houses, we built houses without roofs, right? Like we didn't have like this traditional <laughs> roofs. So, and everybody would say this is still a house. So is a house, does, has, does a house need windows? Like Yeah, if you ask the child, um, draw a house, the child will draw uh, ceilings and roof and windows. But we know a house could be also without windows. So I feel like whatever we are talking about, even a wrist, you know, is a wrist, yes, we would say like five fingers, but if I only have four fingers, because whatever, I cut off my, you know, sure. middle finger, I have um, three fingers and my thumb, it would be still a wrist. So I feel like it's, it's all... It's all what we often, what I often mention is consensus reality we agree on. And based on that, um, we perceive it as an apple or, you know, is an apple, must it be round? No, because if I cut it in half, you would still say that's an apple, right? Like even I would pass you on half of this, you know, yeah, yeah. So I feel like it's it's always a symbolism and what we agree on. Absolutely, Connie. You're th you're th as usual. You're thinking you're thinking is right on. So I just want to kind of nudge you in a, a a certain direction, which is everything you're saying is totally right. Can uh, um, uh, that kind of convention or convenience of language, an agreement in that way? Absolutely. What this is, is I, I guess what I want to nudge you towards seeing is how everything you just said and thought of and articulated was in language. And you are, and you are illustrated or, or, or you said articulated very well what I was trying to say earlier, the way in which all of this is bound up together. It's a giant network of language and There's a way of looking at like your, your world, your subjective reality as kind of a, um, like, you know, those funny word clouds, like the word that gets used most is bigger. And the words, like if you take a paragraph or a book and you create a word cloud and it shows you which words in that book are used most often and they're really big and words that are only used once are very tiny. And so you can get a kind of a, an image of an entire book using a word cloud. You may know what I'm talking about in that. Yeah. So uh, behold your word cloud. <laughs> It has nothing as dependent on the self first <laughs> in, in that way, in the subject object way. Okay, hold on though, Connie, because I have I, I want to get to the suture, which I actually think will help unravel this because we're still kind of in 
just philosophy land. We, we haven't actually gotten to the Dharma yet, right? So I'm going to skip around. I have no idea where this is at in either of the books. And it, you know, I can't, I don't want to waste everybody's time trying to hunt it down. So where I'm beginning, it's not too far where, from where I left off last time. This is where the sutra really starts to become a back and forth between Shariputra and Manjushri. And Shariputra asks Manjushri, crown prince of the Dharma, how do you call or what name do you use to describe? How do you call or what name do you use to describe the Buddha? And how do you perceive the Buddha? By the way, because you might have recognized or noticed, this sutra in particular, the Chinese, it's very, very careful with its use of the word to see. There's a Chinese word which means to see with the eyes. And there's a Chinese word which means to perceive. You perceive with the mind. The character and the word here is, how do you perceive the Buddha? So what, how do you call the Buddha and how do you perceive the Buddha? And Manjushri replies rhetoric says, or yeah, it's tricky, but he basically says, well, how is there a self? That's his answer. Uh, how is there a self? Shariputra, right? Shariputra answers, and remember, Shariputra is supposed to represent like the old school teaching. He doesn't get this stuff. So he answers and says, oh, well, the self is just a name. And the characteristics or the characteristic of being a name is empty. This is, this is Shariputra articulating original old school Buddhism. This is the original message of no self, anatta or anatman. But in the original old school articulation of no self, it was kind of, I, mean, I don't want to, I don't want to summarize it too much because it's actually, it's a very complicated idea. But you can think about it for tonight that the original old school Buddhist idea of no self was kind of like about uh, Michael. Like the, you know, you, you know, me. <laughs> so me with the na name Michael, right? The original old school message of Buddha Buddhism was, I know you have a name, <laughs> and I know that you think that you, Michael, I, Michael, have been bopping around earth now for, for a while. But that name is just a label, and there's actually a constantly morphing, constantly changing, both physically, mentally, sensationally, in every which way possible. There's a constant morphing and changing. And it is really just actually the persistence of a name that gives the illusion of the persistence of a self. And so if you could let go of your name, like literally, I mean, for tonight, again, to summarize it, if you could literally just sort of let go of your name and most importantly, don't take a new name, but actually be in the present moment, always. That would be sort of what the no self of the original old school Buddhism was all about, which was recognizing what was just a name, a label or a word like Michael. It's convenient that I could put a name tag on here. And even though the name tag would get a little weathered, 
I could have the name tag for years and years and years and years and years. I know that it would seem like there was a Michael the whole time, but it should be no, and it shouldn't be news to anybody in the Zoom room here that no self means no consistent self in that way. So Shari Putra says that. He says, well, the self is just a name. And the characteristic of being a name is empty. That's basically like my fist example, by the way. That just because you have a name for it doesn't make it any more real. It makes it really a name. <laughs> it's really a name. <laughs> but the reality of the thing being out there is what is under discussion tonight. All right. So Shari Putra says, yeah, the self, that's just a name. And names are empty. They don't refer to anything. They're just a concept. Right? <laughs> Classic. He replies, so it is. So it is. Just like the self, or just as the self is name, Buddha is also just a name. And this was a tricky one. I, this is, yeah, I, this is very tricky to translate, but it basically says, and being empty of, lacking all characteristics is Bodhi enlightenment. Not by this, I'm continuing the text, not by names is in characteristic of enlightenment or the characteristic of being enlightened. The characteristic is without name and without speech. It is, and this is where I, I actually got into the Sanskrit and the Sanskrit doesn't say that Bodhi or enlightenment is without name and without speech. The Sanskrit says that Bodhi or enlightenment is apada, trackless. And so I want to clarify that really quickly. This, uh, that, so now Bodhi, enlightenment, the Buddha, the, all these ideas, they are apada. They are without name and speech or without tracks. What's being referenced here with this term pada or apada, I should say, is this beautiful, um, I don't know what you would call it, I guess, like, I guess in a, an analogy or a simile, one of those good old Buddhist similes. They describe the Buddha. Tathagata, thus come one, as being trackless, like a bird doesn't leave tracks in the sky. That's the beautiful analogy. The way birds don't leave tracks in the sky, the Buddha or enlightenment leaves no tracks no trace. And that's a, I mean, that's a very, very subtle, profound analogy, especially when you get into pada, meaning the path. And so the, it's pathless, trackless, traceless. But that idea, if you think about it, like, you know, any land dwelling little creature, of course, leaves its little, traces in the sky trace and the buddha and to a certain degree bodhisattvas like manjushri are described 
described as being apada, trackless or traceless. And that has a lot to do with this language of tathagata, thus come, or which is this idea of, as Manjushri will say, the Manjushri often says to the Buddha, wow, you, you arrive without the traces or without the marks of without the trace of arriving or going. And I mentioned that earlier, I tried to plant a little seed by mentioning about how my fist doesn't come from anywhere and doesn't go anywhere, right? It's not like it came from outer space or like it came from wherever. It was just, oh, now the conditions are proper for there to be a fist. And when I blow it out, it's not like the fist goes anywhere. There's no trace of it coming or going. And this, this should, be, you know, I use my fist example a lot, but there's a way in which you can almost get like, oh, wow, that's really weird. <laughs> Like, that's really weird that there's like a word and a name for this thing. And I know what he's talking about and it's real. But when, when Michael asks me, like, where did it go and where does it come from? He's right. It's just a word. If you get that, the, the pranya, the wisdom here is that every single thing you can think of is a word and therefore is of, of the same exact nature as a fist. It's a word and therefore really a word, really an idea, could be encountered as an idea, but ultimately is empty. This is that classic teaching of empty, it, emptiness. It ultimately has no sub substantial reality out there. It has a certain cognitive reality, but that gets tricky too when you start putting the self thinking about like the words keep going. <laughs> the, the words don't just apply to the self, they apply to the thinker thinking. <laughs> and then it starts to get really crazy. Everybody good? Hi, Vicky. <laughs> Michael. I feel like it's just me and you tonight. <laughs> hey, I, I had to turn off my video because everything was wacky and, and I, I don't know even if you'll hear me but um it strikes me like that trackless is sort of like signless over time like it adds an element of time to the signlessness Ooh. Does that make sense oh, oh i'm excited I, it makes so much <laughs> sense beautiful beautiful whereas signs and the signless sort of refer to appearances right qualities of appearance whether it be auditory or visual or otherwise whereas you're right gnome trackless yeah go gnome trackless is more about the signs of coming and going and yeah over time totally hey okay. michael just yeah if I may, just to also comment because it was super interesting uh the concept that noah mentioned no, I'm sorry, uh, about uh, not only uh, symbols, but, but also these concepts such as uh, bodhisattvas being uh, themselves, not just mere symbols, but more like actual like characters, if you will, in a story. So, <laughs> so yeah, just, because man, you three is this continuous character in all th this diverse Buddhas that have this role of the young uh, bodhisattva that he's very uh, sharp intellect kind of guy all the time. And the, <laughs> my point being is that just by recurrently visiting that symbol, uh, and, uh this the very same idea of what we've been talking about all this time. Yeah, and I, I 
I would want to, and you know, in a, in other set, um, all, all these. being trans that's exactly the language of it and and manager Shri is definitely a character that is for sure <laughs> michael one one um short comment you know when when you talk when the sutra talks about um um enlightenment and which is beyond conditioning beyond thinking beyond labels and it's obviously hard to crest because as you said um you know, we things come into form once we have language or once we have thinking, right? Only that comes for me close to, which can then also then obviously apply it, to be applied to all other things is when we talk about love, right? Like when I ask you, you know, what is love for you? And I feel like when I really drop into it and start to name it and label it, it's not love. It's not not the essence or the quality, <laughs> so to speak, of love. And I think we all have the feeling of love. We all know love, right? Like we know it without labeling it. And as soon as we label it, it's like, uh, you know, it's like, oh, love is beautiful or, or intimate or sweet. And it's like, uh, no, you know, so love comes to my mind and yeah, which can then apply. So, yeah. Yeah, totally, Connie. And not that, you know, the, the, the Buddhists and the sutras, they, you know, they talk about metta, loving kindness, and they talk about compassion, but the love that, you know, it's kind of like a, a slightly more Christian love in that kind of agape sense that you're talking about. The Buddhists don't talk too much about it, but I, I, would, I would say though, Connie, that I would agree with you. I would agree with your application of what we're talking about to this idea of love. And I would at that point say that I think you could substitute love for enlightenment and things at yeah. that point. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, that's what I was going. Sweet. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, cool. So I'll just read a little more. Yes. Yes, responding to a comment there. So this is where Shariputra says, that furthermore, Shariputra, you asked how I call or what name would I use to describe the Buddha? How do I perceive the Buddha? Manjushri says, Buddha neither arises nor ceases, neither comes nor goes, is without any name or any characteristic. This is called Buddhahood. And then it gets really crazy. Like the self, no, it actually says this, it's so crazy, but it says like the self-perceiving of the self as the characteristic of capital R reality. That is perceiving Buddha and self-nature. And then it says, whoever has the wisdom to be able to hear and understand that, that's called perceiving the Buddha. It's a very complicated sentence in, in any language, but it's ultimately a very profound one. And it has to do with Manjushri's original answer where he says, Shri Putra is like, wow, how, like, what do you call the Buddha and how do you perceive the Buddha? And he says, how do you view the self? How do you call the self? How do you think of the self? And Shariputra says, well, the self is just a name. And it's totally empty. And he says, yeah, that's right. That's, that's like Buddha, totally characteristic list, all of that. And then he says this crazy thing that it's about, well, again, it's like in any language, it's hard to, to do the language right. But what they're saying, what Mandrashri is saying that is, is that it's when you view the self as reality, not a tiny little player figure in a big old crazy world of billions of people, not a crazy tiny little finite fragment in a long history 
of Big Bang to Big Crunch and Big Bang to Big Crunch and all that. Not that, but perceiving the, or self-perceiving the body is literally what it says. And it's actually kind of the language is self-realizing the body as this Buddha Tathata. So, the, the, the really important part of that, of course, is Manjushri is saying Buddha, Buddhahood is nowhere else, but right there. It is nowhere else, but right here in a way. So there's no need to bow down to somebody that you might think is the Buddha. There's no reason to externalize the Buddha in that sense. Manjushri says, you want to see the Buddha? You want to perceive the Buddha? Well, uh, see yourself as reality. <laughs> now, I want to, I need to get more and it's, well, it's already getting on. So I need to address this reality thing. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to address this reality thing. <laughs> this reality deal. Everybody okay if I try to address this reality thing? Okay, so this Buddha Tathata. So So this Buddha Tathata is this thing that in part one, two, three, four, five, and six, we were calling the Dharma dot two. The realm of the Dharma, otherwise sometimes called the realm of reality. This Dharma dot two realm of reality is this sort of, well, we had a, we had a sutra we had a sutra one night many, many weeks ago from, from the, this book, and they had a beautiful, beautiful translation of Buddha Tathata, or this idea of the Dharma Dot Two. And the way they translated it was the concatenation of all events in the universe. And if you don't know this word concatenation, it's this sort of, well, it's a, it's a crazy idea, but it's kind of like a hyphenation where, you know, rather than having this and that, you hyphenate it. And so like, so I got a, is it a dog or it's a cat? Well, it's kind of a dog cat, <laughs> like dog hyphen cat. So when they speak of the Dharma Dhatu, this realm of reality, they're speaking about seeing the world as sort of like, I sometimes use the language of a monolithic whole. It's far more dynamic than that would imply, but that idea of viewing all phenomena, well, let's say like my cup, viewing my cup, viewing all phenomena <clears throat> as being one super hyphenated noun. <laughs> Not Michael and his cup in his room on the internet talking to the, but the concatenation of all events in the universe. And so what's psychedelically beautifully wild about this idea is that, and this is actually where we're going to, start to get to the practicality of all this, but you could take any given phenomena. You could take my cup, you could take one of the little kitty cats on the cup, you could take what's in the cup, you could take, you could take this voided emptiness here that isn't part of the cup, but is kind of part of the cup. You could take that. You could take any, anything you want and use it as an object of focus to meditate on this Dharma Dhatu. And what I mean by that, if you haven't gotten it already, this concatenation of all events in the universe, it's about like my fingernail. 
And the way that a, the a very idea of the fingernail and the finger, they're, they're kind of like, they're like bound up together. They're kind of a little concatenation, right? Where it's like they, well, from a dependent origination point of view, they really rely on each other and depend on each other to be what they are in this kind of very fluid, beautiful back and forth thing where it's like, oh yeah, I couldn't have a fingernail without the finger, which is part of the hand, which is part of the whole, this, which is, and it goes on and on and on until you realize that any given one thing actually depends on all other things in the universe to be that thing. And it doesn't depend on all those other things in any kind of physical, atomic, quantum way. <laughs> it depends on them because everything is an idea in your mind, a word, part of that language game of yours. And the way that that matrix of language works in your mind is that a fingernail, what is a fingernail? at the end of a finger it's it's it they're one in this they're one in the same actually kind of and that's again part of this idea of the dharmadhatu or this idea of buddha tathata suchness but suchness tathata is when you see all phenomena as one interlocked interwebbed monolithic whole of meaning <laughs> no substance no physical reality. In fact, the very idea of physical reality is predicated on and dependent upon the very idea of the not physical, right? All of these ideas are bound up on all the other ideas. So that's the Dharma dot too, which is inconceivable. By the way, we've been pointing at it and dancing around it all night. Questions, answers, comments, ideas? We really have just scratched the surface tonight. So for those of you at home <laughs> who happen to have and are reading along in the Chinese or the English translation of the Chinese, they start leaving all kinds of stuff out. And for once, I kind of understand why they left it out. This is the part of the sutra where Manjushri, with his, you know, blazing wisdom, this pranya wisdom, really starts going to town. And by that, I mean, not just are the self and Buddha both a word and therefore both inconceivable or both equally empty in that way. Manjushri then goes on to say that the, the five egregious sins, murder and all that, they're just words too. And that's probably why they left this part out because if you're not on your pranya game, if you're not really on top of your non-duality, meaning you're still in duality, then this type of language is gets really tricky. You have to like actually really be non-dual to, to kind of appreciate these sections that start talking about how there's nobody to commit the five egregious sins, nor are there egregious sins, nor is there anybody to be, to have the egregious sins committed against them. So it goes through all of that. And I could go through it all and I'm not doing it to avoid it. We've done other sutras that have talked about how like the, the kleshas are enlightenments and all that stuff. So I'm not shy of those things, but what I wanna do, well, I need to actually skip way ahead, way far ahead, because I want to drop on you this one. This is the important idea. 
this is so what happens is is we eventually get to this again this is after manjushri has subjected everything to this leveling you know and i want you to think about this if you haven't already it's about what happens how can i put this it's about what happens when you equalize everything through this language idea that i've been talking about all night when you really tap tap into this understanding about how all the thinking and all the stuff are just words and words are ultimately just labels and in so far as words are just words and labels they're all equally labels the the word bad and the word good are both equally words they're both equally parts of language you really hear what i'm saying about this in so far as things are just words they're all equal and that very equanimity upeksha is what the buddha is talking about that very equilibrium equanimiousness so from a practical point of view so from a shamatha calming down point of view it's very very nice and helpful to uh, think like i guess to think about the inconceivable in that way which is to give the mind a break from all of this language differentiation discrimination business and so in that equalizing when you really rest the mind in an understanding of the equality of all phenomena via its linguistic nature i'm like trying to give you the the real rational tools to reach upeksha here <laughs> and if i may because i was skipping to the very end and by the way pranya paramita which the sutra is all about is equivalent to the inconceivable buddha ta 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 all everything right that shouldn't come as a surprise so then the buddha answered a series of this is in response to a bunch of other stuff that happened that we skipped over pranya paramita the paramita of wisdom has no boundary and no border has no name and no characteristic no sign no mark no lakshana it is beyond thought it contains no refuge like a sea without any island or any sandbar in it there is no offense or blessing no light no dark it is an indivisible and it is as indivisible and limitless as the dharma dot 2 that's why it's called perfect wisdom so my the practical point that i wanted to, to like really accentuate here like why like how is this not just philosophy or how is this not just spinning our wheels or whatever it's in that line that in this realm that i'm talking about this realm of reality this dharma dhatu in this realm there is no offense and no blessing no merit and what's really 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 important about that is that you don't get to have just one side of that and what i mean i skipped i skipped a thought i had the thought but i didn't say it 
in that there is no offense or blessing, it means there, I don't want to say uh, it's tricky, but the idea is, is that there then should be no guilt, no blame. There's no offense. There's no wrongdoing. All of that, any concept of wrongdoing you have brought to the table and you could relieve yourself of that if you would like. But the idea here is, is that in this realm of equality, there's no wrongdoing. You, you can forgive yourself for all of that. Now I can say the thing that I said, but you only get to do that when you do both, which is that there's also no blessing, no reward, no merit. You don't get to just get away with like the bad stuff and like still get to get the good stuff. This equanimity is serious, meaning seriously equal. <laughs> it's, it has to be really, really, really equal <laughs> in, that, in that way. Okay, questions, comments, ideas? Yeah, Michael, I'm always wondering, and that has this something to do that is Mahayana, or I'm not so into these different schools, so I, I don't know, but, you know, sometimes we have these strong sutras and teachings about, um, you know, the wheel of life and karma and uh, merit and good wishes and good imprints in the mind and bad imprints and cleaning the, you know, cleaning the mind and making it shiny. So there is this, like, good and bad and then we have this amazing sutra which cuts through all all of that all of concept so you know i'm often wondering and we talked about it in our last session i think you know why do we have those these teachings when we have like this ultimate teaching and i don't want to label it that one is better than the other one but the tendency that you have or you know i think naturally come up with is like you know um that of of the ultimate um you know ultimate understanding of it so i'm still like you know i don't know yeah that's, mm -hmm. i'm still wrapping my head around it oh yeah yeah and even even without getting into schools per se buddhism just as one just if we were just to take buddhism as one teaching one general body of knowledge let's say there's basically two modes, two uh, body, like there's kind of within the larger world of Buddhism, there's sort of two types of teachings. And the one is sort of about um, you and your, your mind and your problems and your life. And the Dharma and the teachings are in a, an amazing self-help program. They are amazing teachings for reducing stress, sleeping better, loving better, living better, everything. Oh my gosh, it goes on and on and on and on. The deep wisdom regarding the psychology of the individual, what causes the individual suffering, and then how to, it's like the Dr. Spock's guide to being human. And, and then how to, how to not suffer. It's really right there. And that's a body of teaching. But if you want to know like ultimate reality, we have these over here. This, this is an ultimate reality. This is you still being a little deluded about yourself. And then we have teachings for how to help you along with that. But then there's these other teachings that are about ultimate reality, like what's really going on here about how even this subject object relationship you're having is causing you suffering and so on and so on. And so I know that this often sort of, and, and Connie, this, this has thrown everybody through for a loop. And what I mean, everybody, I mean, like when the Chinese first encountered Buddhism, they were like, wait, but over here, he's telling us to do this, but then he's telling them this, this, this none of it, it exists. Why are we going to do it if none of it exists? So even the Chinese were like, yo, there's two messages here. Like, which is the real message? The Japanese were like, yo, there's two messages here. The Japanese set up six major Buddhist think tanks just to figure out which was the right. <laughs> like, because like, he's telling us these different things. 
And so I'm so always so excited about these, the Dharma, because I think there's the practical stuff. And I think there's this really, really amazing, not, it's not just philosophy. I was trying to articulate how this is practical and applicable to our lives, you know? And again, what I mean is, is that from a meditation, shamatha, calming down point of view, regarding tonight's Dharma talk, all this language, all this chatter, whether it's internal dialogue of words and ideas, or the world of things that I understand through words and ideas, it's all activity. It's all um, stimuli. It's all touched. And so if you would like, again, a further practical application of this in your meditation, it would be in a Vipassana mode, right? In that kind of analytical insight kind of a mode, try to touch the inconceivable. And what I mean by that is, is that if you find yourself di discoursing discursive thought in words, stop it. If you find yourself discriminating objects in front of you as different objects, stop it and try to settle the mind into a singular mode. And if you're like singular mode, you know what I mean? <laughs> strip it down, strip it down. Meaning get if you're if it's a word, let it go. If it's an idea, let it go. And without trying too hard, it's about trying to, well, actually I didn't even talk about it. Well, this is good, this is good. I got oh, two minutes, this is a good segue. I didn't talk about it at all night. In fact, I meant to talk about it all night and I didn't talk about it at all. Eventually, Shariputra, I think it's Shariputra, eventually somebody, asks Manjushri, wow, it's, it's such a great part. He says, oh, it's the Buddha. The Buddha says, wow, you, then you must abide in the, sama, in the inconceivable samadhi, the samadhi, this, this deep meditation on the, incon the inconceivable samadhi. The Buddha is like, wow, you, you, you must abide in the inconceivable samadhi. And, he, and Manju Sri, classic Manju Sri says, well, if there was something that could be called an inconceivable samadhi, then it could be said that I was in the inconceivable samadhi. But because I have no concept of there being an inconceivable samadhi, that's why I'm in the conce inconceivable samadhi. And so it's this beautiful language thing that happens. And so my point was, there's a lot of discourse that then takes place about being in the samadhi of the inconceivable, which I was sort of basically encouraging you all to get into without knowing how. But the idea here is, is that this inconceivable samadhi or the samadhi of inconceivability, it's a big part of Mahayana Buddhism. It's a big part of the Avatamsaka Sutra, that, that giant, huge sutra. In fact, the Avatamsaka Sutra is sometimes even called the Inconceivable Sutra. It's like what it's all about. I wish I would have been able to have a little more time tonight to talk about the actual samadhi, the actual concentration of the inconceivable. Yeah, because there was a lot of parts, but this will all be a segue for next week because I think I'm gonna actually try to finish this sutra next week because the whole end of the sutra deals just with one idea, which is an, a different samadhi. It's called the, the, the single practice samadhi or the, what, they, what somebody translates as the single deed, but it's the single practice samadhi. And in many ways, it serves as a concluding teaching of this sutra. So next week, I'm going to conclude this series 
by talking exclusively, exclusively about this single practice samadhi that ends the sutra. And I will probably start next week with a little uh, review of the inconceivable samadhi, just for, just for fun. <laughs> one thing i just find it interesting that you ended with with samadhi and you know getting the mind into this oneness stillness state or you know i don't you express it a little differently i just wonder or you know like then we we again separate between the mind no mind state which is samadhi and the state with thoughts and forms that we perceive which is not samadhi which is an, again a distinction between two two mental states or states in general so um yeah i think that's for me important you know even you know thoughts and forms are are samadhi right there's no nirvana to go or there's no place to go it's what it is so now i shut up sorry guys no no thank you connie i know your comment is right on and that's again where i wish you know i had ah here we go i'm gonna read the part for connie for everybody really really quickly gotta do it because i found it the buddha asks oh so you've entered the inconceivable samadhi and manjushri replies no world honored one i do not conceive and i do not see a mind that could conceive so that's exactly addressing what connie just said and she said no i don't con inconceivable i don't conceive nor do i even see a mind that could conceive right how could there be talking about entering the inconceivable samadhi and then there's this really interesting part which i'm glad i found he says, Manjushri says, when I first became a bodhisattva, I wanted to enter the samadhi of the inconceivable. But now that I, now basically the, the implication is, and now that I'm not a beginning bodhisattva anymore, he says, um, now that I think about it, there really is no even characteristic of a mind that enters that samadhi. He says, it's like someone studying archery. After long practice, they become skilled. And as a result of their long practice, their arrows always hit the middle, even without thinking about it. He says, I'm also like this. When I first studied the inconceivable samadhi, I gathered the mind around a single lakshana. And as a result, but now as a result of long practice, also, without thinking about it, I am one with that samadhi. Yeah. So, no better way to end it than that, I think. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Connie, for the good questions. Thank you, everybody. Great questions. Great attention.